Hello and welcome to a special Remind and Renew 2021 panel discussion at Philip Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Peter Capretto, Assistant Professor of Pastoral Care in Religion and Culture here at Phillips. Today, I have the honor of moderating a conversation with three truly distinguished panelists who have already gifted us with a wealth of deep insight in the first of their two lectures in our programming earlier today. Allow me to please introduce them for you once again. Our first panelist is Dr. Lee H. Butler, Jr., Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dean and William Cabernet, Professor of the History of Religions and Africana Pastoral Theology here at Phillips Theological Seminary. A giant in the field of pastoral theology, Dr. Butler's many contributions include Loving Home, Caring for African American Marriage and Family, Liberating Our Dignity, Saving Our Souls, and Listen My Son, Wisdom to Help African American Fathers. Welcome, Dean Butler. Our second panelist is Dr. Laurel C. Schneider, Professor of and Chair of Religious Studies at Vanderbilt University and Executive Committee Member of the Board of the American Academy of Religion. A scholar with a truly remarkable breadth of expertise ranging the fields of constructive theology, gender theory, and Native American studies, Dr. Schneider's book-length works include Beyond Monotheism, A Theology of Multiplicity, Polydoxy, Theology of Multiplicity and Relation, and Awake to the Moment, Introducing Constructive Theology. Welcome to Dr. Schneider. Our third panelist is Dr. George Tink Tinker, Professor Emeritus at the Iliff School of Theology, where he spent decades as a leading theological educator and researcher in American Indian cultures, history, and religious traditions. A member of the Osage Nation, Dr. Tinker volunteered in the Indian community as director of the Four Winds Indian Survival Project in Denver for two decades. A prolific author, his many monographs include American Indian Liberation, A Theology of Sovereignty, Spirit and Resistance, Political Theology and American Indian Liberation, and Missionary Conquest, the Gospel, and Native American Genocide. Welcome to Dr. Tinker. For those of you joining us live today, our panelists will be taking selective audience questions later in the hour, so we invite, invite you to begin now gathering your thoughts to ask questions in the designated Q&A panel within our Zoom webinar. Uh, if you were able to attend their lectures, I'm confident they gave rise to much reflection. And for those of you who were not, I'll simply say that you do yourself a disservice not to return to them later for your own edification. Uh, with this structure in mind, allow me to get our conversation started with an open and admittedly large question for our uh, three panelists to weigh in on. Uh, one observation I made is that uh, in their own ways, each of your three lectures today offers theological commentary on how it is that narrative and storytelling impacts the consequences of intergenerational trauma. Because trauma has a wounding and fracturing effect on communities for generations to come, the narrative effect of storytelling and retrieving lost stories is to coalesce identity and experience in the wake of traumatic violence. The alternative, which the United States is regularly an expert at deploying, is repression and disavowal. So my question to the three of you in your research and advocacy is this. In the wake of white supremacists and Christian nationalists in the United States, waging an intense and very real war to rewrite history even more radically through organized efforts like the prior administration's 1776 commission, which if you're not familiar, seeks to erase the history of US slavery and indigenous genocide. How do you three understand the theological task of contesting such revisionist narratives? Are faith leaders tasked with calling out these narratives explicitly through th theological argumentation or is this perhaps a fool's errand that falls into some of the traps of theological argumentation that Dr. Schneider named in her lecture earlier today? Tough question to begin with. Uh, so let me begin a little differently by first saying how happy I am to be with Laurel and Tink again. It's been quite a long time, especially uh, to be with Tink. Uh, the last I saw you, we were together at ILIF during one of my research trips uh, to Denver to study the Sand Creek Massacre. 
and uh, at that point you were writing uh, the article uh, that was later published in the journal about the book that uh, used to be at Isla. Yes, the book. <laughs> so it, it's good to see you both and to be with you again. Um, your, your question, uh, Professor Capretto, I sort of want to jump in at the, the last part of it, of the fool's errand, because there are just some things you can't argue. Uh, we know that when you're talking about narrative and storytelling, when you're talking about history, there is, um, I mean, history itself is, is a narrative. It is pulling information together and telling a story. And so there is always revisionist history that takes place, a history that is put together to ben benefit a particular uh, community. And so um, with, with um, white supremacy being a community, they have a telling of history that is going to benefit their cause. Uh, we, however, who are always at the pointed end of the narrative that oppresses also must claim the history of our people and tell the story. And hopefully there are folks who join as allies in telling a story from the side of the oppressed, from the underside of history, one that is seeking to restore the humanity that the revisionist history is always seeking to take away. So that's where I start enter this conversation. And I'll now give to my, my able colleagues <laughs> to also speak to the question. Do you want me to jump in, Tink? Or you, are you go ahead, got yeah, something to go sure. there? Okay. Well, um, I, I really agree with Dean Butler um, that we can exhaust ourselves um, and actually give oxygen to those systems of, um, of disinformation. And, and in a way, I think that the stronger approach, and you know, I come at this as a white person um, of you know Euro Euro German heritage and all of the inheritance and narratives that carry along with that um, settler colonialism and um, and and all of that to be able to tell a different story, um, you know that I, I see a part of my obligation is to privilege the stories of those who have been most hurt by white supremacy and, and Christian nationalism, those who have been most damaged um, and demonized and, and, and harmed materially and psychically and spiritually. And so the very first thing is, um, it, it is to not put my story first. But, but I also see a really important counteraction to white supremacy is to tell a different kind of white story. Um, and, and part of, I think, the problem for many white people is the sense that, um, you know, that there aren't possible alternative um, stories of those who resisted, stories of those who helped, stories of those, that there is also a, um, a history of, of doing otherwise. Um, and I see my obligations to not let that get drowned out. Um, and to, again, I'll just go back to, you know, those narratives, those destructive narratives only survive if, if they're given airtime um, and to just not give them airtime, but, but to focus my energies um, as an ally and as, um, and as a narrativist in learning from learning new histories to my, you know, learning, learning, not new histories, but learning, learning the stories that are relevant to changing the way that I um, walk through the world. Well, I, I, I agree with both of my colleagues. 
Lee and Lowell. I guess where I would jump in and push a little harder is that history as a narrative in America, in the United States, has always been a romance history of how the West was won. The movie that came out in 1962. It really is that romance of how white people got our land and they're damn well going to keep it. Uh, the, the, the problem with not giving airtime to white supremacist narratives is that their narrative builds off of all of those decades, now centuries, of academic European, uh, academic university histories that, that in so many little tropes continually told the story about how Indians were savage, how Indians were busy killing Indians long before the Christians came and started killing Indians. And that's a lie. It, it's a demonstrable lie. And yet it is the narrative that every fourth grader knows by heart in America's elementary schools. How do we change that? I took the time to trace that uh, in my first lecture, not, not being present, not knowing the audience real well. Uh, I tried to trace it for that reason, just to make sure that we're all clear this happened. Uh, Indian people have been steadfastly erased behind that kind of languaging. In, in standard histories. Uh, uh, let me give you an example of a guy at the University of Oregon. His name is Ostler. I can't remember his first name all of a sudden. He's written a book on American Indian genocide where he's trying desperately to do an American Indian perspective on that history and treat it as the genocide it really was. But he's trained in that other history. Mm -hmm. He can't help but use all of the standard histories that everybody else uses. And as he continues to perpetuate some of the old narrative, even as he says he's challenging that narrative, leaving Indians high and dry because our story isn't told yet in this would-be ally of Indian peoples. Kakuna, I'll stop there. I'd, I'd like to, you know, say also, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I think that that when we talk about not giving airtime um, or the you know, metaphor used of oxygen, um, that could be interpreted as somehow being passive in relation to that or not saying it's a lie, <coughs> not not <coughs> pointing out the lies. Um, it, it, it is so important to tell histories from the perspective of those who lived through them and were and are still being erased from them. So I agree completely with you, um, Professor Tinker, on that. If I may, I, I believe we have a relevant question from our audience that speaks to this issue, perhaps a little bit more granularly, from uh, alum Renee Goodwin uh, asks, I live in a small town in Kansas where a prominent business owning family participated in the insurrection at the Capitol. How do I quote, not give airtime to the destructive narratives when those are the most respected people in the community? Yep, I'd move. <laughs> I do think that you know, choice. We're again. I'm gonna. I'm gonna speak out of being in the in, in the position of a white person who has received privileges of white supremacy and 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 um, and white nationalism, even as I try to resist them. And that I think that we have incredible choices to make every single day because we are surrounded by people who hold those views or who support those views. Um, and and, and, and I, I really do think, 
you know, <laughs> Tink says I'd move. Um, I, I think you are faced with a real question of how do you oppose that in a way that those in your community can hear. Um, and it may mean you get driven out of the community. I, I, I think there, I think the risks are real of finally telling the truth, the risks to privilege and the risks to, to safety. Um, and I don't wanna minimize that. Um, and I don't wanna say that it, it's a simple answer for you at all. Um, but I do think that we are in a moment when we have to make some very, very hard choices about what to put up with and what to speak out against, um, come what may. Along with that, um, my, my first response, which, which Laurel, you have uh, lifted up and, and began to open up, was that we as leaders within the community of faith uh, have the responsibility to listen and interpret for the people what we see, what we hear. We have to speak truth to power. I mean, that is what our, our task has been as theological educators to prepare leaders to take courage but to also be able to interpret what they're seeing and hearing with integrity. And that is speaking on behalf of those persons who are marginalized, as well as speaking up to give courage to folks to be allies. Mm -hmm. And so that does mean that there will be those moments where you are placing yourself at risk. But that is also a part of the tradition of the prophet who had to speak, inspired by the spirit, to speak what is true against those who would not really be willing to hear the truth. But there are those folks who are waiting for their stories to be told, who have been suffering and need the encouragement and need to have you as the leader demonstrate courage, which then gives them more courage. It's an inspiration. I hear that. I'm going to push a little harder, though, because some of this is so deeply rooted in everyday language and metaphors. And we're up against those metaphors in ways that we've got to stop allies in middle of their conversation and say, hey, wait a minute, you can't say it that way. Um, here's a common metaphor that gets used, you know, quite often in the business world and uh, education world and seminaries. We've got to circle the wagons. What does that mean? What's the image that comes to mind and what does it mean? And is it surprising to discover it never happened in real life? It only ever happened in Hollywood? But there it is, it's in everyday language, it won't go away. And am I supposed to educate every white person who suddenly in another conversation entirely <laughs> throws in, we've got to circle the wagons. Hey, wait a minute, you can't use that. <laughs> That's hard work to put on an Indian person. Uh, I'm gonna come back to another one that, uh, that Dr. Schneider used. I'm gonna take a risk here, uh, Laurel, if I can. Uh, you know, wh white liberal allies have decided to use this term uh, settler colonialism as a gentler way of talking about what? What part of settler colonialism was not invasion of Indian lands? What part of the land rush in Oklahoma was not invasion of Indian lands? Yeah. What part of the settler colony in Plymouth was not an invasion of these 
hardcore separatist Puritan Christians who, who uh, didn't like the secular atmosphere in Leiden. They had a perfectly good place to live without being oppressed. But, but the economic appeal of coming uh, to uh, America was so great that they came to take, steal Indian land and eventually engage in murder of Indian people in order to establish their beachhead here on this continent. Do we call that settler colonialism? I think settler colonialism is another metaphor that just erases what actually happened. I appreciate that. I, 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 will, I will think hard about, um, about using that term. It's, you're right, you're it's a common currency not, now in, in, in Native Studies. And it, of course, and I you're think, not alone I think in you're, using it. No, 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 but oh. I think you're right. I really appreciate, I really appreciate you saying that um, because I hadn't thought about how it domesticates the, the truth, which is invasion and genocide. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, one scholar at a time, I make that quote. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I talk to other scholars, so it'll it'll spread. It'll spread. <laughs> for turning to our audience for a, another question, I will just say that this task, this uh, it's easy to name and, and point to. Oh, there are people over there who are practicing repression and disavowal. Uh, I am constantly using language like this, also that again is putting a a veneer over a. Uh, a more serious uh, truth to reckon with. I do have a question from our professor of theology, Dr. Joe Bessler, uh, for the crowd. Uh, he writes, Dr. Schneider and all, uh, if, quote, true knowledge is always a story, end quote, is there a hope for cross-cultural stories that reach beyond our life stories to articulate a broader truth? Question from a theologian. I can repeat that because it is a little bit of a mouthful if need be. Um, I, I will, I'll take a first stab at it, but I would really like to hear um, my colleagues here respond to that. Um, that the claim that knowledge is always a story, um, I think has to always be clarified um, in part in part, I play with that language. I, I, I play with that language um, in order to loosen the Euro-Western presumption that truth is something apart from a story. That truth is somehow separate from the context out of which it comes and and, and in which it stands. Um, and as you know, as the Cherokee writer Thomas King writes, you know, the truth about stories is that's that's all we are. And Joe Bruchak has, has written many things along the same lines. So to recognize the narrative nature of our reality is not to undermine, um, quote unquote, the possibility of broader truth, but it's to recognize that we are always living within uh, s stories that don't, that, 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 that help to make the world. Um, and this is part of the seriousness of white supremacy is it also makes the world in the stories that it tells and enforces and, and it has material effects. So, um, so I think that um, cross-cultural stories um, are what we're always doing. We're always, we are, we are ourselves sitting here on this panel. We are cross-cultural stories talking to each other. Um, it, it's a it, it's an ontological claim I'm making um, that we we are stories in cross cultural exchange, and the question is how are we going to hear each other's stories? How are we going to be present um, to one another? And how are we going to be changed? Um, stories have agency. Stories have effect in the world. Stories are invocational. Um, and I think there are many ways that we can begin to think about that. Um, that isn't just telling stories. It's being stories. We, we are the, we are, I am the stories that have produced me. So uh, I don't know if that gets us started um, down a kind of theological road there, but it's, I, I'm, I'm sh I shift away from the diminishment of stories as mere linguistic products of 
verbiage um, and rather understand stories in a much more ontological um, uh, uh, understanding. I think that's very helpful. Uh, uh, and as always, I want to push beyond it a little bit because in order to answer uh, the, the, the question, uh, our stories are not in all cases commensurable. Uh, and I think that hasn't been dealt with. The assumption has always been that Indian languages are, are somehow just uh, uh, savage codes for English, uh, less sophisticated codes for English, when indeed Indian languages have their own complexity and are at root very, very different or rooted in a very different worldview. Uh, I lost the question, I'm looking for it. The, the main problem for me is that Indian languages are verb-based and not noun-based. Your Christian languages, especially English and German, for instance, are hyper-noun-based. The verbs all play around the nouns. In German, they even capitalize all the nouns so you know that that's the substance they're actually treating and they'll wait and park all the verbs uh, together at the end of the sentence with, 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 with one participle after another participle to end the sentence. And you don't know what the sentence is about until they reach you know, the period at the end. Indian languages are verbal. That means we don't deal in the abstract because we're dealing in real life actions Whereas English and German and other, uh, you know, the Latin languages deal heavily in abstract nominalizations that just cannot then be translated into English. You know, some common everyday words, religion has no place in any Indian language. We don't have a word for God. People want to know what's your word for God. You know, this is a code for English, right? We don't have a word for God. I finally had to write an essay about that, why I don't believe in a creator. Um, because missionaries did go about picking words that fit their category of abstraction. Words for sin, words for evil. Those aren't Indian words. Where are we going to find common ground if we don't have a common ground for your uh, underlying notion of a cosmic struggle between good and evil? It's simply Indian, Indian discourse, Indian life, Indian culture is about harmony and balance at all times and restoring harmony and balance, even as you break the harmony and balance by eating a meal very different. So I, yes, I too want to get to where we can share those narratives together, but it's really difficult when we work out of totally different narrative frames. Part of my response to the question is is something that Tink, you lifted up uh, earlier, uh, probably in your, your lecture, but to engage story, we can engage story as my individual story. This is my experience and it becomes this individualized expression. Um, and, and that becomes this isolating, it allows me to, um, be uh, take a superior position rather than the phenomenological that everyone has experienced and we can all put these together and, and, and be uh, in relationship without having the same experience. There, there comes this way of identifying my story as being 
the right story, the, the right understanding, the right interpretation. But all communities aren't organized that way. There is the our story. There is, I have no uh, sense of self unless I'm in relationship with a larger community, with a family, with a, a, a larger body a history. So that was one reaction that if we're gonna work with story, are we working with story as individualized stories? Are we working with story as a community narrative? Which then pushes me into uh, a term we haven't brought up yet among the three of us uh, is myth, which is also story. Uh, and, and how do we understand the, the mythos that uh, is guiding our behavior, that's guiding our community, that's guiding uh, our understanding, um, and also, again, shaping a community story. Um, so I, I'm back with Laurel that it's, it's not as easy to answer the question because it also has to do with what's your starting point? on how you interpret story. Is it the individual story that you're taking into um, a, a collaborative way of understanding? You know, we can also talk about you know, uh, the collaboration of individuals, which still is holding my space as separate from another and not allowing myself to be changed by hearing another story, which is another way of shaping community. I mean, that's the kind of relationship that, that Laurel and I have had. We, we are telling our stories and being informed by the telling of the story and, and being changed by the telling of our stories, which allows us to grow into new beings and create new community, a new understanding of what it means to be human and alive. I hear that at the same time uh, and by the time I'm done, you're all going to be sorry you invited me to be a part <laughs> of it. <laughs> At the same time, when, when we start talking about the individual story, we're, we're already expressing what I think is the weakest point in the European Christian trajectory and the development of European Christianity, especially after the Renaissance, it becomes radically individualized. And that's what we see in the radical white supremacists today is that radical uh, individualism where the I is the right self-righteous adjudicator of what is pure and true in the world. And they have every right then to uh, uh, attack Capitol Police and to force their way into the Capitol and, and to send senators and Congress people are running. Um, Indian people don't work around that sense of individualism. Right. We are what I call communityist. I, I couldn't use communitarian or communist because those have been already co-opted in the Euro-Christian whole to mean something else entirely. But communityist, where right. it really is our story. There's room for me personally to talk about my experience within the community's narrative of itself. Right. And, and that's exactly what I was trying to say. And so in my own writing, I've talked about communality, that collective experience that I have no existence outside of the community of which I'm a part, which has a history that goes from my family into my ancestors into infinity. <laughs> and I su suspect that's much truer for African-American people than it is for, for Euro-Christian whites. But I'll let Laurel answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I... I'm not going to speak for all white people, but um, I think Why the not? understanding. I I speak for Indians all the time. That's all right. You you go right ahead. But yeah, <laughs> I can't uh, any more than you can. <laughs> all right, but um, I, I I I do think the understanding of community is extremely powerful. I, we saw that on the Capitol. I, I, I there's destructive community. 
Um, and maybe we want, maybe we want to say that's not community, but I think that's not how it's experienced. It's, it's experienced as community. Um, so I think we have to talk about what, what life-giving community is and what death-dealing community is. And both exist. Both exist, I suspect, in all of our, in all of our experiences. But you add white supremacy and its dominance and the Euro-Christian dominance of the world, um, and all the and all the guns and all the power and all the money and all the and all the land grabbing that that, that operates behind that. Um, we're talking about scales of of um, what's the math term? Um, scales of Forget, I'm not a mathematician. There's some term about this, this kind of the, the, the difference of scale um, and, and what that and what that implies. But to understand, for me, to understand the power of community and the power of, uh, 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 you know, of what it means for uh, to what what has to change in the Euro-Christian white experience. Um, and somebody brought up hope, and I really think that's a critical, it's a critical question of how we tell the truth, the really hard truths, how we use the, the, the how we how we use language to, to help tell the truths better and not domesticate them and not and not separate ourselves from the harsh reality of the historical truths and the present truths um, that are going on. And at the same time, I think our obligation is to offer pathways to indicate ways that that we can step by step um, make pathways of hope uh, especially for those of us who want to be a part of, of, of who want to be a part of the change in in helpful ways I should say very briefly, our audience is uh, absolutely energized by this conversation. We already have more questions in our queue than we will be able to uh, to work through in the remainder of our time together. But before jumping into any other, I should give the three of you the opportunity. You all have had the opportunity to, to, to hear one another. Do you have any questions or conversations that the three of you would like to start or that you feel compelled to raise? Uh, in our time together before perhaps turning back to questions from the audience. I'm in favor of um, questions from the audience. I'm, I'm glad to ask more. Uh, from uh, Phillips uh, student, Joshua Shawnee, uh, he writes, quote, Dr. Tinker mentioned the primacy of temporality in European thinking in contrast to a Native American slash indigenous slash First Nations orientation to place, spatiality. How has this impacted the way we do theology in the West? And more importantly, how can we embrace a more cyclical spatial orientation in our theology, liturgical practice, and pastoral care? I guess I've got to start this one off. Huh? I guess, and I would take us back to the early centuries of the Christian church in the Eastern Mediterranean, when church buildings were still constructed with the altar to the east in the opening, to the west, to the rising sun, uh, to the uh, setting sun. Uh, that became a thing of memory as we entered modernity. Now, it's only in high church, your Episcopal and some Lutheran churches where they call the altar liturgical East, even if the building is laid out North by Northwest. Uh, so that spatiality and building a church structure no longer matters too much. In other words, directionality becomes, if you will, if I can take Lee's word, mythic and not real. Uh, so, 
spatiality again becomes dominant. I'm, I'm sorry, temporality becomes dominant beginning with book four in Augustine's uh, City of God, right? Where he's trying to parse the Latin uh, long vowels and short vowels in terms of temporality. Uh, and it, it, it perdures all the way through the 19th and 20th centuries so that uh, when I suggest to students, uh, maybe Heidegger should have written the book Being in Space instead of Being in Time. And they laugh because they think it's a joke uh, because they have read Heidegger and know that that wouldn't work for Heidegger. Uh, but for Indian people, it's always about place and space. It's not what time the ceremony begins, it's where it is and, and how it's laid out. So that Iungli uh, is laid out with the door of the lodge to the east. Uh, unless you're La Jota and the Anipi uh, is today more and more laid out with the door to the west. Uh, uh, but if you're uh, Ojibwe, the door again is to the east. I mean, it, it's not the fact that there's a difference. It's that it matters where the door is. When you're inside the lodge having ceremony, directionality is all important. So at, uh, you know, up in, in Pahuska, outside of Pahuska, uh, a little town called Nilagani up there. My brother started up uh, 20 years ago, the Osage Sundance after 77 years of not having a Sundance. The dancers come in the morning, they walk all the way around the outside of the uh, dance harbor and they come in the east gate as the sun is rising. And they dance all day in that circle. And when they're done for the day, they go back out through that same east gate to go back to uh, their common lodge so they can come back in the next day. That, that, that's really important. Uh, uh, it, it's not on every Sunday, 59 minutes and 59 second liturgy. And I used to tell students at ILF, if you can't do a liturgy in 59 minutes and 59 second, seconds, you're, you're in trouble because your bishop or conference minister is going to have you reposted out by the state lines somewhere. Uh, because the, you know the rich people you're serving, uh, their behinds can't take more than 59 minutes and 59 seconds. I mean, they can, but they want it to be at the International House of Pancakes, uh, where if they if you get done in time, they can be first in line. Temporality is everything. Time is money. Think about the industrial, military industrial complex and business plans. What business would dare engage in a new project without having a temporal plan about what gets done when and how much it's going to cost? Temporality is everything in the West. So that when churches want to return to some sense of spatiality, and I encourage it, uh, it's really difficult to do. As anybody who knows who's been in a church and tried to change the time, the starting time for their Sunday morning worship service. <laughs> so that's a cultural difference. It's a part of the worldview. Indian worldview is spatial. We think spatially. And my mother's people think temporally. If I can overgeneralize that way, and I know it's an overgeneralization. And I've got a lot of students who are fighting against that, trying to do it otherwise. One of the things that um, that I would add in on that is, I think that one way to think about the profound over-reliance of European thought on temporality um, 
is to is to trace it in the theological materials and to see the way that that happens, but then also to see how um, capitalism would not be possible without it, because what Absolutely. happens, yeah, what happens with the the over reliance on temporality and the desacralization of space. Um, and so we can we can really lay a lot at the feet of the Protestants here, and I you know I, I come out of that tradition. But the the desacralization of space feeds into the the over sacralization of time, um, and it then allows for the idea that space is transferable. Um, it doesn't matter where you are; it matters when you are, and you can buy and sell land, you can buy and sell, it, it, it becomes no longer um, imbued with any of its, of its irreplaceability, that yeah. one place is as good as another. Um, and although in real estate, it's like, you know, location, 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 what does that mean? It means only location in relation to the benefits, yeah, the benefits of money and not location in relation to what is the history of this place, the irreplaceable, un, uh, absolute uniqueness um, of, of, uh, of the ground that you're standing on right this minute that cannot be picked up and replaced and made. But our whole economic system depends upon the, um, the commodification of place, which leads to the commodification of bodies, right? It leads Absolutely. to the whole sense that, that bodies too, and you become a thing, you become a student, or you become a cog in the wheel of some kind of industry, or you become, what matters most of all is not what is unique about you, but is the role you play. And that's time at work. That's again, so I just want to amplify um, the point. And one way that we can think about it is how it affects even our inability to appreciate the absolute unique and irreplaceable um, um, aspect of, 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 you know, think, think of the pipeline and how, how so many couldn't understand, well, just move. Right. Just just, you know, you, you don't you don't have to worry about the pipeline going through that land that, you know, just pick up and move. You can go somewhere else. That's that Euro understanding of time being far more important and the, the complete desacralization of place and bodies. And we have to change that. We do have to change that. And there are there are resources in Christian spirituality that have been marginalized and forgotten and unused um, that that are there. So it, it doesn't require Christians to become unchristian to start to recognize the damage that has been done by the over temporalization that has served um, the rape and pillage of the world. Amen to all that. How's that for generalization? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you pointed out, space becomes land. Land becomes property that can be owned. Bodies become commodified property. Uh, and as you pointed out, time is money. Uh, and, and this is directly related to a history within Protestantism. Um, and the, the other part that I thought about, and it's something I even said to students here uh, during orientation uh, about time, because I was emphasizing that I want to reset their body clocks. Uh, and I, I brought in this, this understanding I was given by uh, some South African friends that, that Africans have, you know, generally speaking, but this came from South African friends, Zulu to be specific, that Africans have always had time. It was the European that brought the clock. <laughs> and so it, it's how we relate to it. You know, you've commodified time that right. way. And you have to in order to valorize work. How, how do you know how much to pay someone if you can't tell them how much they're earning per hour? Mm -hmm. Unless they're lawyers, then it's six-minute segments, right? 
a brief comment from our president, Nancy Pittman, uh, on this. Uh, she simply writes, the very translation of Hebrew conceptions into Quinite Greek brought, tempor <clears throat> brought temporality to the forefront. Uh, I, I defer to her expertise as a biblical scholar on that point. I uh, thought that was uh, relevant. I'm also incredibly, yeah, you should all know that I'm now very self-conscious about time and about the fact that I've been tasked to keep us slightly on time. Um, we, we are winding down slightly. Uh, I, I did, we have so many questions. I hope it is okay for me to ask, probably we will have time to ask one final question uh, before, uh, before we are about out of it. And it is from our Professor Emerita, uh, Ellen Blue, Professor of History of Christianity. She writes, as I presented the truth of many of the awful things the church has lent its authority to over the past few centuries, students would say, quote, why didn't anyone ever tell us this? Why didn't we know about it? But the other constant question from students was, then how can I still have hope? I had several methods for addressing that, some more successful for, than others. My question to you, Dr. Blue says, how do you encourage yourself and others to continue to speak the truth out loud and to maintain that Christianity has something helpful to bring to the discussion? Yeah, I'd have to say that I stand with my colleague Miguel de la Torre, who's written a book on a theology of no hope, in which he really takes to task that German Lutheran guy who in all of his deep white privilege can afford to have hope. Talking about Jürgen Moltmann, his theology of hope. After 500 years, 528 years and counting of Euro-Christian invasion and colonialism and domination, I'm not a person to ask about hope. What you can ask me about is why I keep speaking back to the colonizer and I don't intend ever to stop. In part, I can't stop because I have a 12 year old daughter <laughs> and she's just now learning all of this. And you should hear her speak out about some of it, <laughs> but it's for her sake. And that generation of Indian kids coming down the pike that I keep speaking back. And so I, I ask my Euro Christian relatives, give me space to do that, to push back. That doesn't answer your question about where you all are gonna find hope, except that I, invite you all to join me as allies. I am Christian because my family is Christian. I'm Christian because of my own spiritual experiences. Uh, but when I moved that farther out into culture, my Christianity is not grounded in um, the Protestant Reformation. It, it's, it's not grounded in some of the places that we identify as the source or the sources of the Christian narrative. And, and, and so while I speak, and while I struggle, as Tink has mentioned, I, I, I mentioned this to another group of folks, I am struggling because I have um, a young daughter, not as young as Tink's, but I was an older parent and I'm still trying to change life 
so that she has it better, so that she doesn't have to experience a lot of the, and I'm not talking about the financial struggles, I'm talking about the kinds of struggles that I have had in a society that oh, looks yeah. at me as outsider and other. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I'm trying to speak so that she is able to claim her full humanity and her dignity. That is a part of what it means to be alive. Um, and, and so am I struggling with the sense of hope? One might describe it that way, but I'm struggling so that someone else can live with integrity. <laughs> and, and, and then that I have no choice. And, and I struggle from within the Christian church because that's where I have been planted by a spirit. And that's what my experience says me declaring. But even there, um, when you get down into my theology, it doesn't fit into a lot of what one would characterize as faith of our fathers. And I do mean that little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think that for, for me, um, I, don't, I don't feel any need to defend the faith. Um, I am, I, I come out of a long tradition of pastors um, and I've left. Um, there's not, there was never much to offer me as a woman in the tradition. There was never that, that, yeah. that and then I was kicked out because I'm a lesbian. Um, and so I spent a long time um, in my life being, having, you know, I, I, I shook the dust off my feet. Um, but then I also began to realize that there is a spirit in the tradition that has also never been conquered um, and has always been marginal and has always been in the voices of the marginalized who, you know, who, who were burned at the stake, who gathered in the hush harbors, um, you know, who danced and who uh, were just ornery enough, I guess, to not allow the dominant understanding um, to be the dominant understanding. And um, so I, I guess I'm just ornery. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I love the voices that I discover in the tradition of those who laid down their lives for, for justice, um, who resisted. Um, and, and whose understanding of their own Christian faith led them there. Um, and it's not been possible for me to pick up another tradition. <laughs> I've tried. <laughs> and I just keep coming back to, you know, the, the smells and the, and, and the rituals um, you know, that are the rituals of, of, of my own, of my own heritage, but refusing uh, to assume that they have one, that there's only one way that they can be, um, that they can be understood. And so um, I don't have any need to defend Christianity. I don't, if Christianity were to go away today, that would not, that would not be something that would harm me. Um, but I am a seeker of, you know, the, 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 the spirit of love um, that I think has a, an ability. Um, Michaeline Pazantabi, uh, a Chickasaw um, 
scholar and theologian, talks about the return of, of the frog in the spring to, to the desolate, winterized land and how it is that first song of the smallest frog that begins the enabling of, um, of the bringing back of life. And, and, and for her, that is an understanding that even if it all seems, even if it all is, um, without a sense of, of hope, um, that, that we still have to sing our song. We still have to. The alternative is to die. And I get that actually, you know, that's something James Cohn told my, my lovely spouse. I was like, you have to have hope <laughs> and you have to sing the song. And so she loves to tell that story um, of, 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 of him saying to her when she was saying, I, I just don't. And he was, he, he, he said, oh no, no, then, then you might as well just go ahead and die. So for me, it's, it's, it, it, it's about, okay, I, I, I can be that little frog. Dr. Schneider had experience. Oh. Dr. Cohen even had the experience though of being so radically challenged that he gave up mm -hmm. hope mm -hmm. and found himself adrift and said, I have to get it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we also have to recognize that yeah. the world in which we live is one that does take our breath, takes yeah. our lives, and we have to find something that moves us back. And I, I would say that it wasn't hope that moved him back as much as that's the language he applied to what moved yeah. him back to living. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think, I think, you know, we can, we can give to that word hope something that is like all of those other words that become a gloss, you know, they become a way of covering up the reality. Um, they become a way of not, of not seeing the truth and, and, um, and we have to give each other room to, you know, as you said, Tink, we, you know, <laughs> hope isn't the, isn't necessarily what we should be after. I'll take one last shot at hope <laughs> because it's an abstract. It's that your Christian nominal abstraction. What in that H is hope. And Indian people don't have a word for it. So I want to stand with, and this is tough to do because Jim Cohn is an old, old personal friend of mine. And we don't disagree on much, but we do disagree from time to time. Uh, I'll have to stand with Miguel de la Torre and his theology of no hope. And I encourage you to look at his book because it's a powerful read. Uh, moving us into something beyond hope. Uh, and I don't stand completely with Miguel because after all, he's Latino, he's not Indian. Although he wrote an essay in my fest shrift in, in which he claimed he's an Indian too, <laughs> ma making fun of that business of having Indian blood. <laughs> because he's from Cuba and he does have somewhere some Indian blood. <laughs> Friends, it absolutely pains me to be the person to represent that vulgar Euro-Christian white person fixated on these issues of vulgar temporality, but uh, we are a few minutes over. Uh, I thank the three of you for your wonderful insights, both in your lectures earlier today and the conversation. I, for one, have learned a lot. Thank you also to our uh, many audience members who asked many questions. Apologies that we did, were not able to attend to all of them. The good news is that we meet again tomorrow for another conversation after another series of lectures from our panelists. So Drs. Tinker, Schneider, and Butler, thank you so much for your brilliant insights today. I am truly grateful. Good to be with all of you. Thank you.